The working environment needs to be fun. Everything you're doing in life needs to be fun. How do we support our own institutions? How do we support our own businesses? We feel that with the black man spending $20 billion a year, not setting up any businesses, not creating any industry, not creating any job opportunities for his own family, he's not in a moral position to tell the white man that he's discriminating against him. And instead of breaking somebody down, I look at what they do great and I go, wow, people that love and really want great for themselves go, what are they doing right? What's good? Welcome to another episode of It's Black is Lit. I'm your host, Town, here on location at the U of A Track and Field. And today I'm joined by U.S. Olympian and 2016 Mr. Bowerman, Mr. Jerry and Lawson. Appreciate you for having me. No doubt, no doubt. Thank you for stopping by the show with us today, man. Definitely. So, tell me a little bit about yourself. Tell me where you're from originally. Uh, I'm from Texas, County, Texas, which is on the border of Tex Texas and Arkansas. Um, graduated in 2012 from Liberty Island High School, and then of course came to the University of Arkansas um, all the way to 2016, and then stepped right out of college into the Olympics, and uh, went professional, signed a contract with ASICS, and it's been going from there. That's cool, that's cool. So coming out of Texarkana, what attracted you to the uh, University of Arkansas? Man, actually, University of Arkansas was the last school to give me a scholarship. Um, you know, I was I was looking at University of Alabama, Texas a and uh, LSU schools like that, and Arkansas came in late, and I really uh, felt the connection with the coach that was recruiting me, Travis Gefford, which is still my coach today. Um, and then of course I came on my visit up here and you know I see all the records, you know, I see all the people that have been through, Mike Conley, uh, people like that. And so, you know, they really inspired me. It it was somewhere I wanted to come and uh put my mark in history. Already. So how did you initially get interested in track and field? I actually uh I used to play baseball. Obviously everybody plays T ball and you know, goes up to the machine. Um, but I was really interested in baseball, and uh, my team had won the championship the year before, and so the next year my coach quit, and I had to join a different team. And of course, he already had a team, so he put me on the bench. And you know, my father didn't like that, so uh, he told me we was gonna play baseball for the year, and he saw an ad for uh, summer track AAU in the newspaper for a local track team, and so we joined that team, and. Uh, Ever since we joined the team, it just went on from there. Uh, I started in the 400, then I started triple jumping and long jumping. And then, you know, tried out some different things and found out I was really good at it. And so uh, early, about 10, 11 years old, uh, I knew I wanted to be in the Olympics one day and go for a gold medal. So why was being in the Olympics such a, a passionate goal of yours? I watched it on TV. Uh, I watched the um, 2008 Olympics. and. I think that's Beijing, yeah, Beijing Olympics. Uh, just seeing the crowd, uh, you know, seeing different people, Allison Felix, Sonia Richards, uh, Justin Gatlin, Tyson Gay, uh, people you look up to in the sport. And, uh, so I said, you know, that's the, I feel like that's the highest you can go in the sport. And so you, I said, I want to be there and uh, take a shot at being the best in the world. So what is your vision for your career and how have the steps that you've taken and the things that you've already accomplished uh, push you towards uh, achieving the goals that you set for yourself? Um, my vision has always been from that 10-11 uh, Olympic gold medal. Um, I think the only thing that has changed now is uh, I want a world record with that. Um, I think being the best in any sport is, you know, objective because uh, you're always looking across the board and people in history. but. Uh, I, I definitely know and everyone else does, you know, if you get a world record, then, you know, there's no debate that you, you're the best now, you're the best that has been. Uh, I think at every step of the way, my, my success in whatever it was, you know, basketball, football, track, has always uh, pushed me to be better in, wh in whatever sport it is. Uh, of course, I come here and I get my first national championship when I was a sophomore. And so from there, it's like, okay, I want more. I get a championship in the four by one relay. So that's my second championship. Um, and then I pick up the 100 meter dash, ended up running nine, nine. And so from there, going into my senior year, I picked up three events, long jump 100 and 200. And my coach brought me in at the beginning of the season and he, he asked me what my goals were and I told him. And so from there, we trained, like we won a gold medals in all three and we ended up getting gold medals in all three. 
which led to the Byron Award, uh, which led to the Olympic trials. And I think at every step of the way, I just used my previous success as momentum for. No doubt. So what are some of the challenges that you faced in your uh, career as a professional athlete? Well, in any sport, loss, depending on what event it is, you know, it can be embarrassing when you're talented and you don't, you don't reach the goal that you wish you wanted to reach. And so that's, that's been hard, but you know, you learn to overcome it and you learn when you do win, it makes you a better winner. Another one is, you know, just being responsible for yourself. You're no longer in college, you're no longer in high school. You don't have people looking over your shoulder. Uh, things that were free before and now cost money. <laughs> Massage therapy, you know, athletic training, stuff like that. Um, and so the hardest thing is, you know, just being responsible, making sure you stay on top of everything you need to do because uh, there's nobody there to tell you different. You know, uh, you, people say, you know, of course, shoe companies are on, on athletes' heads, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, money is money. And if you get lazy, I mean, there's nobody to come wake you up. If you're late for practice, uh, there's nobody uh, just there to make sure you're disciplined and diligent. And so that's definitely been a challenge. So, Jerrion, as an accomplished professional athlete, what keeps you centered as a person? Uh, that's the easy one. Uh, short answer would be God. Um, I've always been a, a very spiritual person. My mom, I come from a spiritual family. Uh, and I know Jesus for myself. And so uh, I do a lot of reading. I'm always in the scripture. I'm always praying. And uh, what you'll find, man, with every, everything with God is balance. And so uh, even now, I think God has put me in a place where I've become self-sufficient, where I know myself. And so uh, I don't really let any distractions or people, you know, kind of push me around. He's uh, definitely made me immovable. Uh, what's been your most exciting moment so far in your professional career? Uh, uh, I'll say the Olympics, man. Even though it was a loss, uh, I tell people all the time, it didn't feel like one. Um, going to, the, obviously, it's my first Olympics. Uh, you know, the atmosphere was ridiculous. I mean, it's like thousands and thousands of fans in the stands. And uh, for my event specifically, long jump, you know, we get the clap going. And so just hearing a stadium full of people, you know, clap for you who don't even know you uh, was an experience in itself. And really going out there and just uh, taking in the moment and seeing, you know, different people that you've seen on TV always, you know, whether it be Serena Williams, you know, or, you know, anybody, you just, you really take it all in. So what advice would you give to a young person that's aspiring for a career as a professional uh, track and field athlete? Oh man, there's so much stuff. Uh, I say one, learn how to be coachable. Um, I think many of us, especially the ones that have a lot of talent coming out of high school, uh, you can kind of get cocky and arrogant. And, you know, think you, think you know it all, think you know yourself, think you know uh, what you need. And uh, that's the wrong way to think. I mean, you come here to let a coach coach you. Uh, let him do the thinking and you, you do what you're supposed to do. And so your yeah, number one coach, two would be, I say, um, you know, take care of the small details. Um, it's easy to come out here and practice every day and then go home. Um, but a lot of people don't think about, you know, small stuff like, you know, how you need to recover as an athlete, how you need to eat, um, and just a lot of away from the sport things. Uh, eating, you know, make, making sure your weight is where it needs to be. Uh, making sure you're healthy, making sure you're preventing injury, uh, and making sure you recover. For sure. Um, do you want to talk any about the plans that you have after your athletic career? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm currently now dipping my foot into a lot of different things. Uh, I love real estate. And so, uh, and I actually wanted to be an architect when I came to college. Uh, it didn't happen, but I still, you know, love to build things uh, myself. I call myself a little carpenter. But uh, yeah, I love real estate. I love investing in real estate. Um, and my big, my big goal is to start a sportsplex uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, actually. Um, I want to partner up with uh, my brother, Omar McLeod, and uh, you may know him, Dietrich Wise, plays for the Patriots. Yeah, we always said we want to build a sportsplex, build our own gym, and so uh, that's the goal. And I'm trying to push that and have it going by the time I'm 30. No doubt, man, that would be uh, a noble contribution to this community for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, where can we find out about your upcoming competitions? 
Um, in, a, in a lot of places, but uh, I say specifically anywhere on my social media. Uh, just type in Jerry and Lawson, and, and uh, my page will pop up. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. I always post where I'm about to go or where I'm coming from. Um, but for everybody listening, I mean, I will be trying to go for the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. That's the that's the big head honcho. No doubt, no doubt. Uh, well, definitely much luck to you in that endeavor. And Thank we you. certainly appreciate you for stopping by and talking with us today on the show. And we're excited to see everything that uh, you're going to accomplish because we know everything that you have accomplished has, been, has just been tremendous. And we look forward to everything that you're going to do. And we appreciate you being a visionary in the community and making change for people like you and me. So definitely uh, big ups to you. Keep doing what you're doing, man. So uh, up, up, up next on this Black is Lit, we're going to have another edition of Get Out Your Feelings and our word of the day. What's good? It's your boy Town the Hood Scholar. It's time to get out your feelings. Today, we're gonna talk about hidden history. So I always hear comments about what we never learned in school or the history we never learned or how the schools didn't teach us X, Y, or Z. And as much as I wanna respond, you just hadn't taken my class yet, it doesn't change that these are still true statements. In fact, true history has been hidden from us through insidious and systemic practices. But why? It's best explained by the ancient African proverb, until the lion has its own historian, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. In 1933, Dr. Carter G. Woodson published The Miseducation of the Negro, which profoundly explained the reason why we've never been taught our true history. The same educational process which inspires and stimulates the oppressor with the thought that he is everything and has accomplished everything worthwhile depresses and crushes at the same time the spark of genius in the Negro by making him feel that his race does not amount to much and will never measure up to the standards of other people. The Negro thus educated is a hopeless liability of the race. The difficulty is that the educated Negro is compelled to live and move among his own people whom he has been taught to despise. So I'm reading the book and here's this paragraph. Oh my goodness. It blew me away, it blew my mind. Let me share it with you and then I'm gonna move on. The paragraph says, when you control a man's thinking, you do not have to worry about his actions. You do not have to tell him not to stand here or over yonder. He will find his quote unquote proper place and he will stay in it. You do not need to send him to the back door. He will go without being told. In fact, if there is no back door, he'll cut one for his special benefit. His education makes it necessary, period. We must challenge everything that we have been taught and learn to discern those things that we have. Basically, we must remove all expectations for educational systems to provide historical truth to us and our youth. Instead, we must seek out our own history, our own culture, and our own knowledge. We have to share everything that we learn with others in every way possible. We must reassert our voice into the shaping of our own history.